Welcome to this YSL Excel VBA tutorial. This fairly short video is going to explain how to use pivot table slices in VBA. So the video is all about using slices to filter pivot tables, meaning we'll start with a quick recap of how to create a pivot table and a pivot cache that we can apply our slicer to. Then we'll look at how you can create something called a slicer cache before we finally add the slicer to the worksheet that we can then format and edit to change its appearance. The main part of using slices is about using them to filter a pivot table and you do that by selecting and deselecting slicer items. So we'll spend a little bit of time investigating a couple of ways to do that. And then the final part of the video is going to explain how you can connect and disconnect slices from multiple different pivot tables. So you can use one single slicer to control filters from multiple tables. So not too much to do in this one, but let's get started. OK, so the starting point for this video is our standard Excel movies workbook. If you don't already have a copy, you can download it using the link in the video description. When you've got hold of a copy, head straight into the VB editor and we're going to start by creating a new module. The first thing we're going to have to do in this particular workbook is we're going to have to create a pivot table to apply our slicer to. So let's create a quick subroutine that's going to create our pivot table. Now we've done this several times over the course of the last few videos, so I don't want to waste too much time by repeating myself, but we do need some code to create the pivot table in the first place. So let's have a few basic variables. Let's say dim PC as pivot cache, and then let's have dim WS as worksheet. That's the worksheet that's going to hold our pivot table. And of course we'll have dim PT as pivot table. What we can then do is create our new pivot cache by saying set PC equals this workbook dot pivot caches dot create. So there are a couple of parameters I'm going to fill in here. If I open the parentheses, the first parameter is the source. So I'm going to say the source, sorry, big button, the source type. So the source type is going to be equal to an Excel database. So that's what you use for internal Excel worksheets. And then we're going to also specify the source data. I want my source data to be as robust as possible. So although I could set it to be an explicit range of cells on my worksheet, I want to make sure that if I change the range of cells later on, then the, the reference here will still work. So I'm going to say WS Movies, which is a reference to the code name of the worksheet, dot name, then concatenate that with an exclamation mark, and then concatenate that with WS Movies dot range A1, so that's the top left hand corner of our table of data. Then I can refer to the current region property, which is the entire table to which that cell belongs. And finally, I can refer to the address property, which gives me the cell reference. So that code there will generate our pivot cache. Next, I'll set up a worksheet to put my pivot table on. So I'm going to say set WS equals worksheets.add. And then I'm going to give this worksheet a specific name as well. I want to be able to reference this sheet a few times later on in the video. So I'm going to say ws.name equals, and then I'm going to make it equal to movie pivot, which I'll spell properly. There we go. I'll also make sure that I select range A3 on that sheet. I just want to make sure I've got the cell selected into which I'm going to place the top left hand corner of my pivot table. So ws range A3.select. Now I can create the pivot table by saying set PT equals PC dot create pivot table. And again, there's a couple of parameters I'm going to fill in here. So the first one is going to be the table destination, which is nice and easy. That's the cell that I've just selected on the new worksheet. So I can reference that as the active cell. And then the table name. Again, I want to reference the table name a couple of times later on. So I'm going to give a specific name to this pivot table, although I don't have to. I'm going to say table name colon equals, and I'm going to make this equal to movie pivot as well. So movie pivot, close it to book quotes, and then close the parentheses. The final piece of basic setup work to perform is to add some fields to the pivot table. So to do that, I can say pt.addFields. And I'm only going to add in a row field and a column field this time. So I'm going to say row fields, colon equals, excuse me, I'll spell that properly eventually. There we go, colon equals. I'm going to make this one equal to the genre column. And then finally, I'll add in some column fields. So I can say column fields colon equals. And I'm going to make this equal to the certificate column. So certificate. I'm also going to add in a quick data field. So to do that, I'm going to say pt.addDataField. And in this case, I'll need to reference a specific field object. So I can say field colon equals. And then I can say pt.pivotFields. Open some parentheses. And I'm going to use the run time field. And then I can change the function of that as well. So I'm going to put in an average function. Let's say function colon equals. And I can say Excel consolidation function dot Excel average. 
And finally, I'm just going to give this a quick sensible number format. So pt.datafields, open some parentheses, refer to the first one, and then set its number format property to be equal to 0, 0.00 to give it two decimal places. OK, so that's all the basic setup code written. Let me just run this one to generate the new worksheet and the new pivot table. Of course, we could have just done all this manually, but uh, anyway, it's always satisfying to write the code to do it. So there's the basic pivot table that we're now going to add our slices to. OK, then to start adding our slicer, what we'll do is head back to the VB editor and we'll create a completely brand new separate subroutine for this. So let me just give myself a bit of space. And at the top of this, I'm going to write a new subroutine called add slicer. Now again, a little bit of setup work. I'm going to declare a few variables for this subroutine. So first of all, I'm going to get a reference to my worksheet object. So I'm going to say dim ws as worksheet. And then I'm also going to have a variable that can refer to a pivot table. So dim pt as pivot table. So that's the pivot table, of course, that we've just created. Then we're going to need two separate variables to refer to the elements of our slicer. So first of all, I'm going to have something called an, a slicer cache. So dim sc as slicer cache. And then finally, dim sl as slicer. So that will be the physical, the visual object that the user will be able to see and interact with. OK, so having declared all those variables, I'm just going to set a couple of, of the simple ones up. I'm going to say set ws equals worksheets. And having given my worksheet a sensible name, I know that it's called movie pivot. And then I can also say set pt equals ws.pivottables, then open some parentheses. And again, I gave the pivot table the same name. I called that one movie pivot as well. So that's the, those two basic variables set up. OK, so now we're ready to start working with our slicer objects. We're going to start with the slicer cache. Now, the slicer cache is the element that kind of sits behind the scenes, but does all the hard work of actually filtering the, the field or the column you've referenced in the pivot table. The slicer itself is just the visual element, the bit that the user can interact with. So to create a slicer cache, I'm going to start by saying set sc equals. Now, a slicer cache belongs to a workbook, a lot like a pivot cache does. So I'm going to say this workbook dot slicer caches, then full stop, and then say add to. At that point, I'm going to open up some parentheses so that I can see the parameter lists. And you'll see there's two compulsory parameters, the source and the source field. So the source is a reference to a pivot table. Um, it can also be a reference to a connection or even just a string of text. But in this case, I'm going to reference my pivot table object. Then from that pivot table object, I need to reference one of the fields that belongs to it. So in this case, I'm going to refer it to the country field. Now, ordinarily, when I refer to parameters in a method like this, I always name my parameters. As I was doing earlier on, it's not necessary to name parameters, but personally I think it makes code much easier to read and understand. Now there's a really weird little feature of this add to method, at least on that I've experienced myself, whereby if you name the fields when you create this slice of cache, um, it doesn't work. It throws some kind of runtime error when you run the code. So I'm not going to name the parameters here. I'm going to separate them onto different lines, however. So the source for this parameter is simply called pt. And then the source field will just be called country. So that's the name of one of the fields from that underlying pivot table. I can also give my slicer cache a name. And as I've named my other objects here, I'm going to um, I'm going to change the name of this one as well. So let's say uh, country followed by a space underscore. And then the name of my slicer cache I'm going to call country slicer cache. That's a fairly obvious name. There is one final thing I can do here, which is set the slicer cache type. Now, I don't need to do this. You can see that it's an optional parameter anyway. Uh, there are two types of slices you can add. Um, I'm going to show you very, very quickly what the two options are. Excel slicer cache type. Then there are two options in there, a slicer and a timeline. Now, timelines are for working with date fields. And we're not going to do that in this video. I'm going to have a separate video that explains how timelines and date fields in pivot tables work. So for this example, I'm just going to say Excel slicer, then close the parentheses. And that's our slicer cache created. Now that I've set up the cache, I can add a slicer to it. So I'm going to say set sl equals sc dot slices dot add. And again, if I open up the parentheses, I'll see a, a big tooltip showing me all the parameters that I can fill in. Again, with the um, with the add method of the slices collection, if I name the parameters, for me at least, I generate a runtime error when I try to run the code. So I'm not going to name the parameters here. All I've got to do is refer to well, the only thing I have to do is refer to the destination of the slicer, which is a worksheet that I'm going to place it on. So I've got a variable which holds a reference to the worksheet. So I'm going to set the slicer destination to be WS. The level parameter is, isn't redundant for a basic Excel worksheet um, slicer. So I'm going to skip over the level 
parameter by typing in two commas. I'm going to give my slicer a name as well. I'm going to call this one Country Slicer. I probably won't refer to this one later on, but it's always nice to have names that you know exist for different objects. And then finally I can set the caption at the top of the slicer. So I'm going to just set the caption so that it says something like choose countries. And having done all of that, if I were to just execute this subroutine right now to run it, and then hopefully if I switch back to Excel, I will end up with a slicer sitting somewhere near to my pivot table, giving me the ability to filter that table by the country. One thing to be slightly careful of when creating slicer caches is that if it already existed, it, the code wouldn't work. So if I were to head back to the VB editor and attempt to run this subroutine again, we'll find that I get an error message saying the slicer cache already exists. Now this isn't just um, an issue of having the same slicer cache name existing, like, like a worksheet name. You know that you can't create worksheets with the same name. This is something slightly different. If I try to change the name of my slicer cache to slicer cache 1 or country slicer cache 1, the code still fails. So it's not an issue of the name. The issue is to do with the fact that there's a slicer cache assigned to the country column of that pivot table. So just to handle that, if I just end that subroutine there and then just change the name back to country slicer cache, one way we can handle this is by making sure that that slicer cache has been deleted first. Now we can't of course delete it if it doesn't already exist, so a quick simple little bit of error handling code, if we say on error resume next, which you can't always get away with doing because often you'll want of course to make some kind of specific action happen if an error has occurred, but in this case we're trying to delete the slicer cache, and if it doesn't exist, then we don't need to delete it in the first place. So we can happily ignore the error. So the thing we're going to do here is say this workbook dot slicer caches, open some parentheses and quotes. I know that I've called it country slicer cache, so I might as well just copy and paste that to avoid mistyping it. Then close the double quotes and close around brackets, and then of course just say dot delete. I can then say on error go to zero, which resets the error handlers back to their normal state. And if I run this one as many times as I like now, I won't see any runtime errors. It's also worthwhile mentioning that when you delete a slicer cache, it, it deletes all of the slices that belong to the slicer cache. So just showing you quickly at the moment that in Excel I've got this one single slicer. If I were to step through this subroutine here, just up to the point where I delete the slicer cache, and then at that point I'm just going to end the subroutine. If I switch back to Excel, you'll see that the slicer attached to that slicer cache has disappeared as well. Now it is possible to delete slices independently. So say for instance you wanted to remove all the slices from one particular pivot table. Let's just have a quick extra subroutine that shows you how you can do that. If I create a sub which says delete slices from pivot, and then I'm going to copy a couple of the variables from earlier on. So I'm going to copy the, in fact, all of all four variables as it stands, and the two lines which set references to the worksheet and the pivot table. So I'm just going to copy and paste those in. I'm going to get rid of the variable which refers to the slicer cache. I don't need that for this particular example, because all I'm going to do here is loop over the slices collection of a pivot table. So I'm going to say for each SL in PT dot slices. So each pivot table has a collection of slices that have been assigned to it. So there I can say next SL, and then within the loop I can simply say sl.delete, as you might expect. So if I were to just run this first subroutine to generate the slicer cache and slicer again, and prove that that's there, if I were to run my delete slices from pivot subroutine, then this time all the slices attached to that pivot table will be gone. The slicer cache still exists, however, so th there would still be an issue with creating a new slicer cache based on that same column, um, but in this case it doesn't matter because I've already written code to handle that. Let's move on and look at a couple of the basic things we can do to manipulate the appearance of the slicer. If I just click back into the subroutine which created it in the first place and run that one again, looking back at the Excel workbook you'll see the slicer kind of sits itself roughly in the middle of the visible worksheet. It might be nice to position it so it sits at the top of the pivot table, so it's in line with the top of the table, and maybe the height of the slicer should be the same as the height of the table. There's a couple of ways I can achieve that. It's actually possible to do this when you create the slicer in the first place. If I switch back to the, the code and then just click somewhere inside the parentheses of the add method for the slicer, when I press Ctrl and I on the keyboard to display the IntelliSense, you'll see there's a top, left, width and height parameter. So the top controls the distance from the top of the slicer to the top of the, uh, the sheet, and the left property contain, controls the left distance from the left of the sheet to the left of the slicer, and width and height are hopefully fairly obvious. So I can do this when I create the slicer, but it's sometimes slightly easier to do this afterwards, so you can modify all of these properties after the slicer has been created. Now I'd like to 
change the dimensions of my slicer so it meets the dimensions of my pivot table. So what I'm going to do first of all is declare another variable towards the top of this routine, dim r as range, and then I'm going to use that variable to get a reference to the range of my pivot table. So once I've added the slicer, I'm going to say set r equals pt dot table range one. Now there are two table range properties. Table range one is the range of the pivot table minus the page fields. We didn't actually add any page fields in this example, so that's kind of redundant. And table range two is the same table range, but including the page fields as well. So in this case, I'm going to go for table range one, although it doesn't really matter because we don't have page fields anyway. And then what I can do is start modifying the properties of the slicer object. So if I say sl.top, I can make that equal to the top of the range. I can say r.top. And if I say sl.left, this is a little more complex. I want to make this equal to the position of the left of the table plus the width of the table plus a small buffer to shift it across to the right a little bit. So I'm going to say r.left plus r.width plus, let's say, 20 points or so. So the measurement units for this is in points. The height, I'm going to do that fairly quickly and easily. sl.height equals r.height. And then, big button, I'll go for the actual property I wanted there, height. And then sl.width, let's just make that equal to an explicit value, let's say 200 or so. OK, so having done that, let's just run that code again. And if we look back at the Excel worksheet, we'll see that we've changed the position and the dimensions of the slicer. It's also possible to divide the elements of the slicer up into different columns. So let's have two columns for the countries in this slicer. If I switch back to the VB editor, and then just down below where, I've, where I was changing its size and dimensions, I'm going to change the number of columns to two. So I'm going to say sl dot number of columns equals two. Now currently they'll the column widths will be equally divided between the uh, the width of the slicer. So if you wanted to, you could change the individual column width as well. So I could say sl.columnWidth equals, let's make those equal to 200. So the overall width of the slicer will be 400, which means that that line's kind of basically redundant, so I can just comment that line out. So if I just run that subroutine again, we'll see when I switch back to the Excel workbook, I've got the country names arranged in two separate columns, with each column having a width of 200. One final thing I can do to modify the appearance of the slicer is to apply some kind of style to it. So if I just select the slicer manually and have a look at the options tab of the, of the uh, ribbon, you can see there's a slicer styles section. They're not particularly exciting, I have to admit, but it just does just let you change the, the basic colors. You can also create your own new slicer styles if you really, really wanted to. I've never seen much point in doing that. Now, all the slicer styles have a name. Um, so to set this in code, then you just use the same name that appears in the tooltip, minus the spaces slightly weirdly. So if I wanted it to be this sort of dark green color, that'd be slicer style dark six. So to make that work, if I switch back to the VB editor, and I can say just somewhere down below here, sl.style equals and then as a string, I can say slicer style, if I can type that properly, eventually I got there, slicer style dark six. Okay, if I just run that code again, and then have a look back at the Excel workbook, you see I've got this <laughs> fairly hideous green, shade of green. Um, so you might want to play around with those a little bit, or even just leave it as the default. Let's see, I might change it down to number five, which was a shade of blue, which fits in a little bit better with the actual style of the pivot table. So far, we haven't actually used the slicer for its intended purpose. The slicer is designed to filter the pivot table to which it's attached. So if I were to select one of the countries from the list of countries available, it will select that item and that item only, and then filter the rest of the pivot table to show only the, the results which are relevant. So I can switch between multiple different countries here by clicking on different country names. I can hold down the control key and select multiple different items. And when I let go of the control key, then the pivot table will refresh. And I can also remove all the filters by just clicking the clear filter button up here. So of course, that's usually done by the person using your pivot table, but you can also manipulate it in code as well. So what I'm going to do is head back to the VB editor, and then somewhere down at the bottom, let's have a new subroutine called something like uh, filter pivot with slicer. I'll spell that properly eventually, there we go. Now when it comes to filtering items, you apply the filters to the slicer cache rather than to the slicer object. So to make that work, we're going to declare a variable, dimsc, as slicer cache. 
and then we'll reference the slicer cache we created earlier on. So I'm going to say set sc equals this workbook dot slicer caches, and then the name of the slicer cache was country slicer cache. So I'm glad I gave it a sensible name earlier on. There we go. Um, at a simple level, then to turn on and off an individual item in the slicer cache, you can refer to it as a slicer item. So I can say sc.sliceritems, and then in a set of parentheses I can refer to an individual item in there. I can do that either by index number, which isn't the, the most useful way to do it, or more usefully by name. So let's say sliceritems.unitedstates, and then let's make that selected property equal to false. So if I were to run that subroutine there and then switch back to the movies workbook, you'll see that I've unselected the United States. So you can do it individually for each individual item in the slicer. Now as well as manipulating each item in the slicer items collection individually, you can loop over the collection to process the entire thing, just like looping over any collection of objects in VBA. So let's say, for instance, I wanted to loop over all of the slicer items and then, I don't know, unselect all the names that have got a space contained within their string uh, for some bizarre reason, I don't know. And um, this is just really to prove that you can loop over a collection and then apply criteria to determine whether that item should be selected or not. So in this case, we're going to look for a space in the name and if a space is there, we're going to, uh, we're going to unselect that item. So back into the VB editor, let's just, we might as well just use the same subroutine here. So let's have a new variable at the top, let's say dim si as slicer item. And then I'm just going to comment out the line which which unselects the single United States item, and instead we're going to say for each SI in SC dot slicer items. Let's say next SI. And then the test that I want to perform in here, I want to test, I want to look, first of all look for a space inside the name of the item. So I can do that using the instra function or in string function. And if I look in the slicer item name and I look for a space, as long as the result of that function is greater than zero, then I know that I've found a space in the name. So if that's the case, I can say si.selected equals false. Otherwise, what I want to do is say si.selected equals true. So that will select all the ones that don't have a space in their name. So having done that, if I were to just run that subroutine and then have a quick look, and I'll see that this time it's unselected all of the countries with a space in their name. Now you could apply a similar technique to reselecting all the items. You could loop over the entire slice items collection and change the selected property to true. But it's probably more convenient just to use the clear all filters method instead. So just to very quickly show that, if I switch back to the VB editor, I can add an extra line of code at the bottom here that will say sc dot clear all filters. Now of course that makes the loop completely redundant. I don't need that code in there at all at this point. That would uh, just filter and then unfilter the slicer cache. So let's just run that subroutine as it stands, look back at Excel, and we'll see that all the items have now been selected again. Now at this point you may well be thinking that your slices don't really do much of a different job than just a regular old page field or report filter, and that's fairly true. But there is one nice advantage of using slices that a page field doesn't have, and that's that a slicer can control more than one pivot table at the same time. So what I'm going to do is write some code to add in a new pivot table starting somewhere down in let's say cell A30 or A31 or so, and we'll have a slightly different arrangement of fields than the current pivot table. Let's just create that code fairly quickly then. If I switch back to the VB editor, I'm going to scroll all the way up to the top of the code where we created the pivot table in the first place. And then let's just copy and paste that entire subroutine. And then we'll change its name so that it's called something like add new pivot table. Now there are a few different changes we'll need to make to this. First of all, we're not going to try to create a new pivot cache at all. So I'm going to take away all the code there that creates a new pivot cache. What I'd like to do is refer to the existing cache on which my existing pivot table is based. So the code that sets the worksheet as well needs to change. I don't want to add a new worksheet. I'm going to set that to be equal to my movie pivot sheet. Then I don't need to change the worksheet's name. So, excuse me, I forgot the close parentheses there. I don't need to change the worksheet's name, that's already set. I'm going to change the cell that I select, so it's select cell, let's say A31. And then once I've done that, I can set my pivot cache so that it refers to the pivot cache of the first pivot table on this worksheet. So I'm going to say set PC equals, 
ws.pivot tables and I can refer to this pivot table either, either as the number one because there's only one pivot table on it but I also gave the pivot table a sensible name earlier on so I can say movie pivot and then I need to refer to the pivot cache property of that pivot table so that will return the, the cache that already exists rather than generating a new one what I can then do is essentially everything that I've already done to set up the original pivot table. I'll change its name so it's inventively called Movie Pivot One, and let's just have a slightly different arrangement of fields as well. Let's rather than having the genre as the row fields, we'll have the distributor as the row fields. So at that point, having changed all that code, if I just run that subroutine now, switch back to the Excel workbook, I'll find that I've got a new pivot table with a slightly different arrangement, which I can now link in to this existing slicer. OK, so to make this work, I'm going to create another new subroutine. So let's have a new sub just down below that's going to say connect slicer to multiple pivots. And then I'll need a couple of basic variables. I'll need a worksheet, a pivot table, and a slicer cache. So let's just copy the worksheet and PT variables from the previous routine. And then I'll also declare a PC, oh, sorry, an SC variable, dim SC, as slicer cache. Okay, so I'm going to set WS equal to worksheets and then say movie pivot. And then I'm going to set the PT to be equal to WS.pivot tables. And then the one that I've just created was called movie pivot one. This will just make it slightly easier to reference in the next little stage. So I'm going to set this, uh, the slicer cache. So I can say set SC equals this workbook dot slicer caches and then I, I called it country slicer cache and then finally what I can do is add a pivot table to that slicer cache so I'm going to say sc dot pivot tables dot add pivot table then all I need to do is reference the pivot table that I want to add in and that's the one that I've just referred to or set a reference to in that variable just to demonstrate that that is actually working, I'm going to say sc.sliceritems and then open some parentheses and say, let's say United States, and then say selected equals false. So that will connect both pivot tables to the single slicer cache controlled by that single slicer, and then should unselect or deselect United States from the list. So let's just have a quick run of that subroutine, have a quick look back at the Excel workbook, and you'll see that it's definitely changed the uh, the row row height of the uh, the original pivot table it should also have done that for the second pivot table as well I guess this will be easier to see if we actually um, maybe select a few different items let's select Japan for instance there you go you can clearly see that, that single slicer is controlling both pivot tables let's just clear all the all the filters from that just to bring everything back for both pivots it's just as easy to disconnect a slicer from multiple pivot tables as well. So if I just switch back to the VB editor, we can just copy and paste this entire subroutine because there's only a couple of simple things to change here. Let's change its name first of all. So it's called disconnect slicer from multiple pivots. And then the last remaining thing to change, once I've just edited the name, the last remaining thing to change is rather than saying add pivot table, we can say remove pivot table and again you must reference the pivot table that you want to remove from the slicer so having done that I can run that subroutine and then if I look back at the Excel workbook you'll see that United States has clearly been filtered out of the original pivot table but in the second pivot table that's not the case again if I just change this manually by selecting a different country you'll see that the original pivot table changes the only thing that changes in the second pivot table are the column widths based on the column widths of the first one there but the actual table itself isn't being filtered at all. So there we go, there's a quick overview of using slices for pivot tables in VBA. If you like what you've seen here, why not head over to the YSL website where you can find loads more free resources including these videos, some written blogs and tutorials, and even some exercises that you can download to practice your skills. Thanks for watching, see you next time.